Today's episode of This Week in Startups is brought to you by New Relic. Visit newrelic.com slash twist and see why thousands of developers worldwide don't deploy without it. And by audible.com, a leading provider of spoken audio information and entertainment. Listen to audiobooks whenever and wherever you want. Visit audible.com slash twist for your free audiobook. And by Amazon Web Services. Get the resources you need to easily get started with AWS Activate, a new global program for startups, including AWS credits, training, developer support, a startup community forum, and special offers from third parties. Learn more and sign up at aws.amazon.com slash activate. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. It's Jason Calacanis. This is This Week in Startups. We're live here at WeWork. <laughs> Wow, so loud, so loud. And of course, my guest today, Alexis, the co-founder of Reddit and uh, also Hipmunk, and uh, we're gonna talk about his new book and censorship and the internet and journalism and life in general. Stick with us, it'll be an amazing episode. That's what it's all about, man. They said, funny is the root of all evil. What? Funny how it feeds my people. Yeah. We ain't gonna live like me. Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money, spend the money and defeat you Hey, welcome back, everybody. My guest today on the program is Alexis Ohanian. Ohanian, did I pronounce it correct? Oh, yes. There, there is an Armenian somewhere who's like, Ohanian, but you know what? It's okay. Sorry. Ohanian? I, call, I say Ohanian. 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 Yeah, it's, it's I've cool. heard Ohanian from people. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. I, as, long, as long as you call me, right? That's what matters. Absolutely. So listen, uh, Reddit has become an absolute global phenomenon. Take us back to when Reddit was founded. When did you guys found it and why? And uh, where were you? So Steve Huffman and I started it. Uh, technically, we started the company while we were in Charlottesville, Virginia, as undergrads at UVA. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Jefferson's University. I see some Wahoos in there. The... Uh, the, the, the original company we had started was called My Mobile Menu, or Mmm, and mm. is, that, is that because it was a great name or a terrible <laughs> name? I'm really proud of my branding, but all right, fine. Forget my Mobile Menu. menu. And, Tell and us it, what My <laughs> Mobile Menu did. I'm sensing you would have not invested in us. We, we, we wanted to allow people to order food from their cell phones five blocks away from the Starbucks. This Remember, is 2005. It's 2005. So the smartest so phone a was a trio. Exactly, with okay. a stylus or some jank. I, we were going to figure like out an SMS solution. I would like the general, yeah, uh, so's, yeah. chicken. It was, it was a little early. Um, but we knew we were going to do it. We knew we were, we were going to do it. I talked Steve out of taking a nice, comfortable job at a software company in Virginia. And, uh, and then we heard a guy named Paul Graham give a talk. Uh, in Harvard called How to Start a Startup. And it was during our senior year spring break. We were the only people in Virginia going to Boston on our senior year spring break uh, because beaches suck for laptops. The, the glare, there's no internet. Yeah, why would you go to, why would you go to a beach? Yeah, why would you go break? to a beach during spring Absurd. break and Absurd. hang out on the beach with a bunch yeah. of girls? I, you, yeah. you, why would you do I, that? You had a very different college experience exactly. than I did. So anyway, you, we hit you, level you, 60 in World of Warcraft, <laughs> which is true. It's true. So you have the chance yes. to go party yes. in Miami. You decide, yeah, fuck no. it, let's We're going go. We're going to Boston. Hear Paul Graham talk about startups. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. And is this before? Is this the, it's after, before YC. Before YC, yeah. I was about to say. This was you, just Paul Graham, the sort of internet pundit who had had success in the first boom, making the first online store, Yahoo Stores, or Via Web, which was originally called. And Steve was just a huge fan of his because Steve was a Lisp programmer. Any Lisp programmers? Of course not. There's one. Yeah. I'm sorry. Oh. Well, Steve... You see the homeless guy across the street oh, who was a Lisp programmer? Lispers. <laughs> I, be, beware. That, that beware of the market. scorned. <laughs> yeah. But we... We, we went up there because, you know, Steve was a huge fan of his essays, and I thought, you know what, this seems like it'll be really useful. It's called How to Start a Startup. And we met with him afterward. Steve got a book signed, and then I followed, and I was like, Dr. Graham, it would be really worth buying the cost, buy, it would really be worth buying you a drink uh, to, to pitch you on our idea. We came all the way up from Virginia, and he was just shocked, I think, we came all the way from Virginia. Yeah. And said, all right, we'll meet up. And, and we met with him and, and pitched him, mmm, for like an hour, and he loved mm. it. And, and sure mm. enough, three weeks later, he announces Y Combinator, and we applied. And uh, we went up there, interviewed, did a great job interviewing, and they rejected us. And, yeah, and then we got drunk. 
And the next morning... So wait, take us to that moment where you got rejected. Because this is the first year. There wasn't really a formal process. Yeah, no. No one knew So what, you get an email like, wah, wah. We got a phone call that night. And, and I remember this. this. This is... I finally admitted this in the book. I hadn't actually told anyone. It's just easier to type. Um, that night, Paul calls and he says, I'm really sorry. You're just, you're, it's just not going to work. And um, I don't know what, it wasn't that abrupt. He was polite about it. But anyway, we got really drunk. And we hung out with a bunch of friends of ours who were Harvard graduates. And um, we met some of their friends who had just gotten jobs, great banking jobs at like, I don't know, Lehman Brothers probably. And, and they were bragging. <laughs> Bear Stearns. Yeah, they were so proud, so cocksure. And, uh, and they were bragging to us about all the money they were going to make. And, and I, 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 I was so ashamed. I was like, yeah, you think that's cool? We just got into Y Combinator. It's this seed stage accelerator for tech startups. And we're going to just do amazing stuff with mmm. And, and it sucked so much. As, I, as the lie was coming out of my mouth, it felt so bad. And so I drank more. And, uh, Always a good solution. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well... And yeah, there might be, well, yeah, it, too, yeah. It, was, it was for that night. Okay, wait, wait, uh, so now how does our hero, or heroes, get accepted back into Y Combinator? Blackmail. No, uh, we called, <laughs> we, we took the train back to Virginia that next morning, uh, hungover, hungover, of course, yeah. and, and Paul calls, and, and I pick up, and he says, listen, we like you guys, we just don't like the idea. It's too early for mobile. If, you, if you're willing to kill this company a year in that you've been working on, we'll let you into the program. And it took us about five seconds. And we got on the next train back to Boston, sat with Paul for about an hour, and he just sat us down and said, all right, forget mobile, build something on the web. What problems do you guys have every single day? And Steve was a heavy Slashdot user. I read a bunch of tabs uh, every morning of, of news websites, but neither one of us had a solution for really news, like a new kind of website that would be a front page for everything. And, uh, and Paul had mentioned delicious slash popular. Now, note, at this point, I have not said the word dig because we did not know about dig, but we knew about delicious slash popular. I mean, and in, in, in fairness, that was Kevin's inspiration mm -hmm. for dig. He always gave credit to delicious, which mm -hmm. was started here in New York by Josh. Yeah, Joshua Schechter. Joshua Schechter. Mm -hmm. Delicious.com, which mm -hmm. was a bookmarking tool, mm -hmm. allowed people, just said these were the things that were bookmarked the most today. Yes. And bookmarks were the signal. Yes. And, and we noticed... So we had never used it, but Paul was, was talking about it, and we thought, you know what, there's an interesting thing here. The byproduct of people bookmarking reference material, you know, to look at later, like Ajax tutorials or like travel planning, um, was an interesting kind of zeitgeist, but it was only a zeitgeist for reference material, not for what was new. So like here's social bookmarking, it's doing its thing really well until Yahoo acquires it and kills it, and we needed to be something else that was a place for people to go to find the more ephemeral news of the day. And um, that's how we got started with Reddit. Now, it took a while for it to catch on, but it's become quite a phenomenon. When did you know that this was more than just, you know, a small little boutique startup effort? We knew we were onto something when the great Jason Calcanis was trying to buy our users. Yes. That... Uh, and you You're know, being facetious. Well, it was, it was interesting because at that moment we realized, because I remember, so let me make this more clear, Y Combinator was nothing. No one had ever heard of it. It wasn't anything that was important to anyone. It was based in Boston. There were, based what, Boston. 10 people in the class, the first one? Uh, there were 11? maybe 10 companies. The Demo Day, which is today the most contested, I'd argue, in the world, had like 12 of Paul's rich friends who were just like, what the fuck are we doing here? You said there was going to be free food <laughs> and booze, and who is this kid talking on stage about Reddits? You know? Um, and, and we, were in, we were in Somerville, Massachusetts. We, you know, literally never got on, we never got press in TechCrunch until the day we got acquired. Um, we were, we felt very much on our own in this own, in our own little world. And we were tutors in a little apartment working in our underwear in between games of World of Warcraft on something. And it took months for anyone to really start caring. Um, but when we saw signals like that, we thought, you know what, we're onto something. Mm. Uh, and, and thankfully, we had great mentors in Paul, because when we found out about Dig about two weeks after we launched, and I looked like a fool for doing a really terrible competitive analysis, um, he, said, he said some great advice, and I found the email, because I was tired of people always asking me, how did you copy Dig? Um, I found the email, and it just said, meet the enemy, dig.com. And Paul was like, you idiot, don't be worried. Com competition, competitors will never beat you. You only beat yourself. And rather prophetic, uh, at yeah. So what's the state of Reddit today? You're on the board. Mm -hmm. It's been spun out of um, okay. Condé Nast, which mm -hmm. purchased it at some point, mm -hmm. um, and you guys did very well. Um, 
the site got sold for thirty or forty million dollars or something incredible. You know, I made I made a gentleman's agreement with Steve Newhouse that I would not talk about it publicly. But oh, okay. People Google. Yeah. So anyway, something like that, thirty yeah. or forty million dollars yeah. or twenty, or whatever it is. And we were twenty three years old. In twenty three years old, so you Crazy. have this. What was that like to have Condé Nast come to you and say, in year, was it five or six, we want to buy this? What was that like? How did that happen? Oh, no, no, this was this was sixteen months, sixteen months into the company. It was only 16 months when we, we actually, I first met Karoj Karam Khani, who's the, the biz dev guy who did the deal, maybe a year into Reddit. And we started talking about a licensing deal first, and eventually, you know, it got a little bit more serious. And it was an acquisition literally 16 months after we got started. Wow. It's crazy. And this was driven a lot by Wired, by Chris Anderson, loved it, and I, wanted to I do like know. his own versions of Reddit on Wired, or? I, I don't know. Um, I know, you know, actually Steve Newhouse has long been really fascinated with Reddit. And, you know, Karosh had the, obviously the very good taste in thinking we'd be a good acquisition target. Um, although I know he had also talked to Dig. I'm sure there's some interesting stories back there. But, you know, uh, Steve Newhouse actually has always been a huge champion of the site. Uh, I don't know if he's, you know, Redditing late at night like the rest of us, but who knows? <laughs> um, how big is Reddit today? We just broke 80 million unique visitors a month. So uh, to put it in perspective, I think Twitter has 240, 250. Yeah. So about a third of Twitter, um, or 10 New York cities. I measure everything in New York yes. cities. Yes. Yeah. Um, that, that's a pretty or 4,000 like Madison Square Gardens. Or there we go. I, more, of net, of more of a Nets guy. Uh, I don't know how many Barclays that is. Yeah, it's a decent Brooklyn. number. Well, I think Barclays is kind of small compared to the Garden. But anyway, it's um, really about how you use it. I exactly. think. Exactly. Well, we'll see what happens this season. I'm, I'm feeling pretty good. Are there any Nets fans here? Yeah, oh, that's what it. What up with my Knicks really? fans? Where are the Knicks fans? Yes! Oh, wow. Like, that one guy, that guy the over one there. guy. Wow. Um, anyway, putting aside the Knicks-Nets rivalry, um, how, how, do you, how do you look at this like massive success Reddit has become? Obviously, some people might criticize you for selling it too early. Of course, you were 23 and becoming a millionaire at the age of 23 is a pretty awesome thing, I would assume. Um, but do you regret selling it? I mean, do you wish that you owned it today? No. And, and I, say that, I say that with 100% certainty. One, because when Reddit was spun up by Condé Nast, they came back to me and said, hey, do you want to be CEO? And I said, thank you, but no thank you. Um, so I definitely don't want to own it. Um, I think I could be in a good position as a board member, an advisor to help, and as an active user. But um, no, you know, I mean, I had, there was a lot of stuff going on in my life personally, stuff that I will not talk about because it makes me sad, um, but you can read about, um, that made that decision very easy for me because I never, I hope all of you have the chance to make a decision about whether or not you want to have your life changed with wealth uh, for a 16-month-old project um, or an 18-month, I, I hope you all can have that decision. And, and for me, it was a very clear one because I had a lot of people who were being so incredibly supportive of me that I did not want to ever look back on that moment and think, what the fuck did I do turning that down? Because you don't know, we really don't know. The recession hit two and a half years later. Um, I don't, who knows, who knows? All right, when we get back from commercial break, I want you to tell me about um, Reddit's involvement in news today because it really is becoming a driver. We saw with the Boston bombing and, and many other cases, actual random acts of journalism occurring inside Reddit when we get back from this commercial break. Hey, what a great program we're having, and it's made possible by my friends at New Relic. They make the most powerful, the most deft, the most elegant, simple, yet complex application performance tool in the world, and I use it myself here at launch. Uh, New Relic has over 50,000 customers now, and you know, that's really interesting because when we started having them as a partner on the program, it was like 30,000, then it went to 40,000. Now we're talking about 50,000 customers, including people like Nike, uh, Warby Parker, Airbnb, and Comcast and AT&T. We use it here, as I said, um, to keep me in the loop. And look, at here's what the email looks like on my computer screen. I get a nice email that says, hey, the launch ticker had 99%, 0.99% uptime, 10,000 views, 5.6 uh, seconds page load time. It's a big page with a lot of images, so you can uh, understand that it takes a little time. But I love the fact that I get that email every week, and I love the fact that my tech team is using it every day 
and making sure that our services are fast uh, and as fast as they can be, really, because speed is the best feature. They're constantly innovating over at New Relic, and they've just announced that they've added Node.js to their languages to monitor. Uh, and you obviously, you obviously know that's an extremely popular with uh, real-time apps like Twitter and Call of Duty. So uh, there's nothing, no solution like it. It provides such a broad level of deep and actionable data that I give it my highest recommendation. Go to newrelic.com slash twist. That's right, New Relic, R-E-L-I-C.com slash T-W-I-S-T, This Week in Startups, newrelic.com slash twist, and you will get a free This Week in Startups t-shirt. There it is. Huh? You can't buy that t-shirt. You can only get it if you sign up for a free account with our friends over at New Relic. It's super fast. It's super easy, and no credit card is required. Let's all take a moment to thank at New Relic on our Twitter accounts for making This Week in Startups possible. Okay, let's get back to this amazing program. And we're back. <laughs> the audience is like, was wow. Quick. It was like a that was wormhole. <laughs> Um, the show has supported you by nothing. Um, so the Boston bombing happens. Uh, the New York Post puts two people on the cover and says, these are the Boston bombers. They weren't. The Reddit community goes to work diligently, I think, examining all the social media and processing it in a group effort. And I just thought to me, this is not really speculation as much as investigative journalism. This is the greatest thing ever to get hundreds and hundreds of people working around the clock to try to process this information. What did you think when you saw the amount of attention? Because I think that was the most public moment for Reddit up until that point. Um, what did you think of that phenomenon? Well, uh, this, is the, this illustrated the, the gift and the curse of social media. And yes, the FBI asked people for help in identifying suspects. Oh, sorry. Yes, the, F the FBI did ask people to help identifying suspects. The problem is, when you create a, an open communication platform, whether it's Reddit or, or Twitter, um, you allow anyone to try to help and participate. And very quickly, people can make mistakes that spiral out of control, that, that catch steam. The, the thing for me is, you know, as long as humans are part of the equation, there are going to be errors, right? Just weeks after that, the Navy Yard shooting happened and NBC and CBS both misidentified someone. And these are hardworking, very smart, very talented journalists. All this is to say, whether it was amazing journalists doing it or just random people with cell phones, mistakes are gonna happen. And it is, the, the onus is on us as users to use these open platforms as responsibly as we can, to not blindly retweet, to not blind, you know, the, and, and you know, the New York Times Magazine did a very good breakdown of like tweet by tweet, upvote by upvote of what happened that day, and, and found the random, it was actually a random Twitter account that fa first falsely identified that innocent young man on the police scanner. And it was just a total lie, total made up tweet yeah. that got picked up and started getting retweeted by legitimate journalists and started getting picked up. And I, uh, in a lot of instances, these tools are used for amazing good. It crowdsources amazing, wonderful, great things. Um, but it's ultimately people that are doing it, and likewise, it can be used improperly. So I, you know, uh, the, 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 the unfortunate reality is there's not a, a total technological solution for any of this. Is it a net benefit for society, though, that people are participating so much, or do you think it's people should just be quiet and wait for the proper journalistic you know, process to occur? I, I think it is a net benefit for society. I, I hope that as journalism evolves, and, and we're seeing, I think cable news is probably having the hardest time with this. They used to have the monopoly on our 24 seven attention spans, right? The first 24 seven news, whether it was Desert Storm, 9-11, anything else was the thing that we all keyed into, now it's the internet. And so many of them are still trying so hard to be first that you get what happens during the Navy Yard shooting. You get what happens when two major news organizations misread the Obamacare Supreme Court ruling. Like that was reading text on paper and people were so frantic to be first. The internet is always gonna be first, it's not always gonna be right. Um, and that's where journalism really needs to play the vital, vital role in our society of actually doing the journalism to sift the data from the noise. And what do you think of journalism today? The biggest sites, the highest growth sites, things like BuzzFeed, Buzzfeed yes. which people in some ways group with Reddit mm -hmm. um, because of, the, I guess, the memes or just mm -hmm. sort of the genre, but Gawker, Business Insider, um, Huffington Post, what do you think of those sites and how they operate? <laughs> yeah, honestly, they, they all do. Oh, you're always going to get it real for me. Yeah. I, <laughs> they, all, they, they all do 
they all do an interesting job of curating. Now, I'll snarkily say they curate a lot of it from various subreddits, from other people's Twitter accounts, from the masses. But that's great. I'm, I'm happy more of them now attribute than they well, used Gawker, to. Well, Gawker, yeah. I mean, it seems like every third story on Gawker has hat tip Reddit. Yes. They, they grudgingly credit the subreddit or whatever that, that sourced it. But, the, you know, it's, it's the same way that's just sort of polite. If someone tweets out an interesting link, you'd, you'd cite it. Uh, the one that's most intriguing to me is actually Upworthy. And full disclosure, I am an investor. But they, they have grown, I think, one of the fastest growing media companies on the premise that people want to see and share positive, socially good news. And so they'll find a YouTube video about something that is sort of good for the world and come up with a great headline for it and, and send it out there. That's, that's intriguing to me because I really always, I, I had yet to see evidence that something could do better than cat photos or dog photos or yeah. whatever kind of photos you like. And that's, that's really heartening for me. It actually shows that, look, there's real demand here for positive stuff, not just bleeds it leads, but actually yeah. inspiring great news. Uh, and I think there is, there's still such a long way to go. I'm, I was actually having a conversation with a very smart journalist about the future of a lot of these institutions, whether it's WashPo or New York Times. And one of the things that I, I really wanna see them step up with more is to be that source of record on Almost like you need to know what's going on in Syria right now. Here it is. You don't go to Wikipedia for it. You go here. And, and I don't know if, I mean, there, there, various organizations have done this, but use that clout. Use those resources. Use those amazing journalists to, to create things that are, the things that get tweeted, the things that get submitted to Reddit. Yeah, and, but you're seeing, in addition to the listicles and all the mm -hmm. craziness over BuzzFeed, they're starting to hire some real journalists yeah. to do some actual real journalism. So do you think this is the changing of the guard? Like they were using mm. the slideshows and the, the Reddit memes in yeah. order to get the traffic, to get the money, to get the real journalists? Here, yes. And what's so, what's so brilliant about it and one of the great reasons to be an upstart rather than an incumbent is buzzworthy. Any new brand can get into the game with the cat photos and the listicles and then by doing good journalism, be perceived of as being, you know, it takes a Pulitzer and all of a sudden people are gonna be like, okay, that's legit. However, you could never imagine an incumbent like the Washington Post saying, all right guys, top 10 favorite cat photos of the week, because they come from a place of such reputation and such status that like it, I couldn't imagine even with Bezos in there actually having that discussion and having it get nowhere. Um, but I think there need to be more and more institutions of new media, of new journalism, that are figuring this out because it's still far from being a solved problem, certainly on the business model side, and it's so important. Well, how is Reddit as a, as a business? I mean, it's a very small number of employees mm -hmm. based upon the massive number of unique visitors. Do you have, you have more uniques than the New York Times or I think similar? So. 80 million, I think, I, I don't know. I don't know their it's internal It's kind of like probably similar. Probably and so, but, but they 30. have 1,000 people or 600 journalists or something. How many um, people work at Reddit? I think it's up to 35. We have it actually, we have our New York offices in WeWork. Shameless plug. Nice, well yeah. done, well yeah. played. Um, so 35 and 80 million uniques, uh, it's over 2 million uniques uh, per employee. And I think 5 billion page views, which, is a really, really misleading number because if you can't monetize those page views, uh, <laughs> having billions of them is only so useful. Um, we're, I hope we're on a trajectory that is, you know, that one day looks like Facebook or Twitter, well, mostly Facebook, where you are at least being, res uh, you're being, you're, actually I won't even compare it to them. Steve and I always wanted to put user experience first and we didn't want to litter a site with ads. I remember the first time I went on Dig and saw a giant McMuffin above the fold. Yeah. That was definitely a moment where I was like, these guys are so hosed. Like they yeah. clearly don't respect their users. The, you know, the fact that we've been able to stay so lean has also been a huge advantage and I really hope, I hope the future of ads, at least for Reddit, is not advertising. I hope it's Reddit gold which already I think represents now maybe a third of revenue. Reddit is not profitable. In fact, Yishan, our CEO, did an amazing job putting all this stuff out there in a blog Explain post. what Reddit Gold is for the audience that doesn't know. Uh, it's, a, it's a subscription uh, that you can make to Reddit that gives you a little bit of status within the community. It's just it gets you access to a private subreddit. You get some little perks. It's all digital though, right? It's very easy to scale. It's just some ones and zeros and some CSS. And you can also gift it it's other members. So like, let's say the Brooklyn Nets subreddit, which I would love to get more subscribers. Um, 
you know, someone makes a really great comment about how the Nets are going to just dominate the Knicks this year. Um, and, and they've put a lot of work into it. They've sourced a lot of data. They got a lot of stuff. Instead of just upvoting them, you gift them gold. And it costs you a few dollars. And it's amazing how this has become a currency within the site as a way to reward beyond just upvoting. It's a way to reward, you know, really great behavior and really great contributions. And I, I hope more and more business models can be with communities instead of against them. So... Let's talk about leaving Condé Nast. Why did Reddit spin out from Condé? They, and I, well, I can't speak for them, but Reddit could not have been as successful still under Condé. Uh, and I think, I think the leadership there realized that and recognized that, especially because Steve and I had left at this point. And, and a, number, a number of the talented people there on an already small team were going off to do other things. And it was clear that like, there was something that was growing week after week after week. Something was working, but at least, and you know, to Kanye's credit, no one expected that acquisition to work, right? Old media company acquires a few kids in an apartment with a social news website. And, and, and at least they knew, all right, you know what, the best thing we can do for this thing is set it free. And if it comes back to us, it was real love. No, but they, they have a majority stake in yeah. the company. Uh, and, and so it's, I think it was very strategic and frankly, I think really smart. Um, and you know, I, don't, I don't just say it as a board member, I say that as a user. Well, let's talk about sort of the downside or what people would you know, say the dark side of you know, Reddit. Creep shots or just bad behavior on Reddit. There's a bunch of, I mean, anytime you run a social network like this yeah. and it's open, bad things happen. But, it seems like Reddit is fighting to allow sometimes the bad things to occur or to allow freedom of speech. Was that a big reason why it had to come out of Conde? Because you wanted to make it so that anybody could do, you know, you had an easier time allowing the community to do what they wanted to do. And where is the line now as an independent company? Yeah. Because there have been some pretty atrocious stuff and there's some stuff that is just creepy and then there's some stuff that's kind of like, dead people or dead babies or, uh, you know, creep shots, mm -hmm. stuff that none of us would really want to be involved in. So right. how do you reconcile that? Okay. All right. So I, I, I don't think it had anything to do with the Condé Nast spin out. Yeah. And, but as an independent company, you know, and, and Yishan has spoken very publicly about this, that, you know, in creating any of these open platforms, and this is, this is echoing the same sentence, sentiments of a guy like Dick Costello at Twitter, um, you know, none of this, whether it's, links out to content, because it's all, none of the content's actually hosted on Reddit. Every subreddit has links out to other places or, or text that discusses things. The vast majority of the content, 99% of it, is either benign or good. Uh, and the 1% that isn't is the kind of, you know, is the reflection of humanity that when given an open platform sometimes acts awful. And if it is illegal, well, that's a no-brainer. But if it is legal, uh, it is a f awful, really awful, and sometimes really offensive, but still there. So, dead baby Reddit or dead kids, mm -hmm. like, you, th you personally think it should be there, or you think... No, I mean, are you kidding? No, I wish it weren't there. I mean, right. the... But don't you have the ability as a board to say, you know what, we just don't want to have this on the site, so if you want this, have your own, or does that cause no. just a well, huge but, but ride inside of Reddit? Well, but, you know, I mean any of these platforms, humans are resourceful, right? We don't want people using cell phones to prank call 911, yet people do it every day and cause all kinds of havoc. We don't want people to tweet photos of all of that stuff you're talking about. There are Twitter accounts right now with <laughs> lots of followers who are doing this. Um, and yes, there are subreddits that link to content that I find reprehensible. Um, the problem is there's no total technological solution for that. There is, you're, you're endlessly playing a game of cat and mouse, and at the end of the day, look, Reddit's also open source. So you know what would happen? <laughs> People are resourceful. The source code gets downloaded, someone fires up a site in Slovakia using our source, and, and it proceeds. And so we obviously condemn it, uh, but while it still remains such a small percentage of the site, we take the same approach as our social media peers. And so um, it's interesting. I mean, I. I want to push back one more time, though. Mm -hmm. It is a private company. Right. So is Twitter. Yeah. And 
you can choose, though, to not have that stuff there. And I think there are tools. I mean, YouTube seems to do a pretty good job of policing porn on it. They hire companies to right, stop it. Right, right, But YouTube hosts the content, right? right? Reddit does not host content. Reddit is a collection of links to mm -hmm. other places. Got it. There's no, I mean, just like Twitter can't be a total so solution. So it's easier to just put up a link than it is to upload a video, I guess. Yes, but it's also just from a technological standpoint, right? YouTube right. can police their videos because they host videos on their servers. Right. Reddit can't police it. You can't take the stuff hosting. off the destination, right? Right. And is that why, well, why did you guys choose to not host images? Because Imgur is becoming this yes. huge business that everybody's talking about Imgur, and they're actually plugged for Bigger WeWork. Bigger than Reddit. They're bigger than Reddit 100, 100 million unique visitors a month now. Um, but they grew off of Reddit. That's um, awesome. So why would that not be Reddit's business? Is it because you don't hmm. want to host nonsense? No, it's because, you know, at the time, we talked about it, at the time, we thought image hosting would be a scaling nightmare, mm. and we had a team of five. Yeah, but and that was 2005 before Amazon Web Services. No, 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 but even, no, when Imager came on the board, I think it was 2010, you can yeah. check me on this. Even then, we had the discussion, probably 2009, 2010, we had the discussion around Reddit, but we didn't want to be in the image hosting business because we still just had a team of five <laughs> trying to manage a site that was, you know, doubling all the time. Um, but they have, yeah, they have very, very real issues dealing with that, I presume, but part of uh, the image hosting business. So it wasn't to sort of give you the cover fire to say like, hey, we don't host anything, because that is sort of keeps you neutral that there's nothing hosted there. You could never have anybody complain that you're stealing anything that's copyrighted because it's not hosted there. Yeah, I mean, that's just the reality of the technology, right? In the same way that Google is a collection of links to content, Twitter is a collection of I know, of but is it strategic, text. right? Like, to No, I mean, you gotta remember, dude, we were two 22-year-olds fresh out of college who were just yeah. trying to keep living like college students. Uh, so the goal was really, let's just build a platform for online communities to share links. All right, when we get back, I wanna talk about your new book, and I wanna talk about if Reddit will ever launch its own image hosting, uh, when we get back from these important messages. Ah, uh, yes, an audible, audible, audible ad read. The easiest thing in the world for me to do because I use Audible every day. Uh, if you don't know Audible, well, where the hell have you been? It is the leading provider of audiobooks, and you can buy individual books, or you can sign up for one of their listener programs, which gives you a book every month, or you can be completely baller like myself and buy like 20 credits at a time with their platinum subscription. That's what I do. There's over 150,000 titles in every genre, uh, and it automatically syncs between your audiobook and your Kindle, um, and you can read at home, listen in the car, you know all that stuff. We have a special offer. It's just for our audience. You get a free audiobook. Hey, what could be better than that? Audible.com slash twist, audible.com slash twist, and you'll get a 30 day free trial. Thank you so much to our friends at Audible for that. And my pick for the week is The Willpower Instinct, how self-control works, why it matters, and what you can do to get more of it. And, uh, you know, I saw this book there. It was very popular. It had great reviews. And that's what I love. I mean, you look at the overall... Um, there's a great community in Audible, and I'm proud to be part of it, because... You get people writing these uh, great reviews. You can see very easy five star review, four star review. Because you know, you always have that fear when you buy an audio book or a book that it's going to suck, right? And when you have thousands of reviews, like Audible does, because it's so popular and they have so many loyal supporters, and people write multi paragraph reviews, you know, you're not going to get a clunker in a lemon. You can avoid that problem, and that's one of my big fears, and I'm over it. And so anyway, this this book, I'm about halfway through it. This audio book, The Willpower Instinct, is absolutely fantastic because it really gets into um, how willpower manifests itself on a biological basis and how you can have more willpower, whether it's to not eat uh, you know, as many sweets, not drink as much, not be as much of a compulsive gambler. Well, let's forget about that last one for now because I want to keep my gambling instinct up. But I really have enjoyed this book, and um, I'm actually going to listen to it on the way home today in my uh, Tesla. So that, that's what I do is I just sync it right over with my Tesla on the Bluetooth. Beautiful experience. And I feel like I'm getting smarter all the time. You know, I try to keep up on science and psychology and, and the Salinger uh, book, which I uh, listen to, because I want to be, you know, like smart in the world. I don't want to be one of these dumbasses who just goes to a party and people are like, hey, what's the last book you read? And you're like, well, I don't read. Well, the fact is I don't read. I, don't, I mean, I read newspapers. I read the web. But I don't really like reading books all that much. I like listening to them. And the audio performances are amazing. They're having an iPad mini contest, which is fantastic. All you have to do is send your Audible confirmation to audible at launch.co, audible at launch.co, and you'll be entered in 
to win an iPad mini signed by me. The contest ends on December 18th. Let's all just thank at audible underscore com. And just, I, I like to thank audible for coming to the launch wearables conference and doing a great job there, the mobile wearables conference, and for making such a great service that provides so much value to me at Jason. All right, let's get back to the program. That's enough audible love for one day. Oh God, I love you guys. And we're back here live at WeWork uh, with Alexis. Thank you. Big round of applause. Uh, so, um, are, do you think Reddit will launch hosting? I mean, that would be, that would just skyrocket your, if you hosted media, wouldn't it skyrocket your traffic even more? It would. Uh, there is not a clear monetization strategy for that other than just banner ads. Uh, I, I really, there are no plans. And there's no reason to at this point if people are I mean, Imager's doing a great job. And that's the other thing, too. You know, a, a bunch of people came out and said, oh, my gosh, Imager's bigger than Reddit. How upset are you? Like, how does that make you feel? And I'm like, it makes me feel great. There's another service in the world that's providing the first image hosting site that doesn't suck. Like, great. I, whenever people talk in those zero-sum terms, it just makes me feel bad for them. Because uh, it's like, is your life really that, like... Would you think Imgur could ever become a competitor? I mean, you do see sure. them having comments underneath the images yeah. now. Oh, yeah. And people are going directly there to look at the same images. Totally. It's a different... It is a, it is a competition for attention in the same way Twitter is and Tumblr is and WordPress is, etc. But uh, the value... You know, there... The, the, the reason, and this is why, God, I would, if, if Dig had copied this, I think they'd still be around. You know, three months into Reddit, Steve and I decided this is going to be a platform for online communities. Anyone can create a subreddit about turtles, about the nits, whatever. And, and by making it this open platform, it allowed us to grow to where it is today. And that, you know, I've, in all of my travels all over the world, one of the things that still strikes me is how many forums, like old school PHP BB forums are still like, I'm in Egypt two months after Mubarak falls and everyone's telling me all the places we still talk about news are these old school forums in probably the least web 2.0 terms. Reddit's just forums 2.0 and, and that software, that simple software that lets people submit links and have discussions about them is a way that I think so many people around the world could use to replace the old school model. And I think that's where a lot of our growth is coming from. I mean, the, the, my favorite statistic of the last two months about Reddit was that of all the social media platforms, this is according to a Pew study, um, we are most, the most popular platform among Hispanics in America. And uh, that's really exciting to me, right? 11% of all Hispanics use Reddit, and it's higher than Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook, name it. Um, that's cool because I think there is a huge hunger here, especially internationally, to have open forums for discussion. And that's what we do that I don't think Imager will ever do. Uh, Facebook chose to uh, not allow anonymity. Twitter allows handles, mm -hmm. um, so they allow anonymity. Mm -hmm. Obviously, Reddit is anonymous in uh, probably the majority of cases. Pseudon. Su su pseudonyms. Anonymous. So, yeah, they have pseudonyms. Pseudonym, yes. Pseudonyms, yeah. So um, what do you think about anonymity in the net? I mean, some people argue it's absolutely essential. Other people are arguing maybe um, it's time to rethink that. What do you think? I only the Sith deal in absolutes. So what you're going to get from me is... <laughs> well played. <laughs> is it is, it, like, like Jay said, it is a gift and a curse. The... The reason, the thing that makes me sad, and this is just the reality, is you know even in the wake of, I think the Canadian teenager Amanda Todd's suicide because of cyberbullying, you had her school friends who she knew, who had their real names and their real photos, vandalizing her wall after her death. Right? Awful, awful, awful stuff. Even with their name, even with their photo. I don't think anything replaces being in front of a person. People will always, even if you attached their everything to it, still be awful people online and do stuff like that. Louis C.K. actually is a good comment on this. But anyway, the, the, the reason why I, 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 I am optimistic about the role it plays is because I see every day how many people have their lives changed in a positive way because they can speak behind a pseudonym. We have LGBT subreddits, Rainbow, uh, gamers. We have, I get to see communities online using these subreddits to have honest and frank discussions about homosexuality because they could never do that in the communities they live in. And that's one particular example of the power of the pseudonym. And, and so I think yeah, it's, it's, it's not an amazing thing. It's, not an off, it's, it's just a thing that can be used for great stuff, can be used for bad stuff, but there will never be a solution uh, because as, as Louis C.K. pointed out, 
it's, it's the reason he won't let his daughters have cell phones is because they never get the sense anymore of how much hurt they cause a person if they can just tweet it at them or if they can just post it on their wall. You actually, you can't empathize if you can't see a person get their feelings hurt. And, and I don't know what the solution is for that. Louis, you know, not letting his kids have cell phones or use the internet, but like, I, I don't know, I don't know. This is a societal thing we're gonna have to tackle. Let's talk a little bit about your book without their permission, how the 21st century will be made, not managed. Um, what's the book about, why'd you write it? It is about entrepreneurship, and, and some of it's my own stories, but whether it's Reddit or Hitmonk, the best parts are about people I've gotten to know in philanthropy, in music, in film, in activism, who are all being entrepreneurial, using the internet, and, and basically reaching their maximum levels of awesome thanks to it in a way that they just literally could not have even five or 10 years ago. And, and I'm, I'm taking this message to 75 universities across the country uh, because I wish, it were the, I wish it were the thing I had when I was in school. 75 universities. Yeah, just did four. Actually, Cooper Union was my favorite in New York, so I'm repping them today. So you just go there and talk to them about entrepreneurship. What do you tell them? I mean, what do you think at its core entrepreneurship is and how did you become an entrepreneur? I, I don't speak French, but I think it means has ideas and gets them done. And, and we, we, do too, I, we do a great job celebrating entrepreneurs, like inviting them on podcasts and having them talk about stuff. But every one of us is being entrepreneurial. Um, I was talking to a room full of scientists up in Albert Einstein in the Bronx today. And like, they're, all, they're being entrepreneurial every day. And what is so exciting now is that no matter what your hustle is, and I mean, you guys all know this, right? Whether it's the arts, whether it's music, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, there are more and more platforms allowing you to take those great ideas to the world. And I just want, I want more, I want better ideas and I want people who maybe historically would not have been able to get those ideas to the world to be able to now. And the internet's not a magic wand, but the more people that hear about this, the more people we can get on this playing field, the better. What do you think has changed since you started almost 10 years ago as an entrepreneur? Cost of starting a startup, cost of the technology. I mean, as you said earlier with Amazon, we had to install, we had to buy servers from Newegg and install them in a colo facility in 05. And in 10, when we launched Hitmonk, all we needed was a credit card. Um, the platforms that not only we as builders can use, um, whether it's how much open source has just gotten so much better, um, so many better libraries, um, but also social media, of course, has given everyone a soapbox. Um, it's just, it's just gotten so much easier and will continue to get easier for people to be awesome. I mean, right? Something as, as ostensibly simple as Kickstarter now funds more art projects than all of the NEA. I mean, that's kind of sad about the NEA, but it's, it's also, again, forever the optimist. It makes me very hopeful because I get to meet and work with these artists who are now finding their audience and getting the funding and making a living doing something that they couldn't have done 10 years ago. And it's a, just one website, just one example of many. What do you think about what's going on in the United States with regard to the NSA, PRISM, and a lot of this sort of spying on Americans, um, Snowden? I, you know, Jason, I wish there were more tech executives who talked about this. Um, I felt none of them do, right? Like, I, I felt can't like get I was anybody the, to talk about it. Yeah. I felt like I was the only one during Sopa and Pippa. Uh, I still feel like I felt like the only one talking during CISPA. I feel like whatever. The point is. I th we have to make it very clear because I know, you know, when the Patriot Act came about, we were all pretty shell-shocked, but that was almost 12 years ago. It's time to take a deep breath and really evaluate how much of our privacy we're willing to give up in the name of security. And what the NSA surveillance releases have shown us is that we've never had a chance to have that honest, public, frank discussion and that there is no line between our digital right to privacy and, 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 and what people can get access to. It's like, we all know as Americans, right? Fourth Amendment says, hey, I've got mail, or hey, I've got a home. If you want to get inside, get a warrant. There's due process. It should be that obvious for my email and for my digital home, right? My Dropbox, my storage. And unfortunately, we don't have a lot of politicians who really understand that. And uh, we also have a Congress that, unless something has changed drastically in the last few hours, is also not really going to work. Right, colonoscopies are rated right higher, higher than our Congress right now. And they're important, they save lives, don't laugh. <laughs> really. Facebook. Yeah. What do you think of the Facebook? Wow, that's an open question. I, I was the only person on TV bearish about their IPO 
just because I was pissed that they were supporting CISPA. And then three months later, everyone was like, how did you know? That was amazing. You're a prophet. I'm like, no, I was just complaining about CISPA. Um, I, there, there are some very, 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 very smart people over there. Uh, and uh, I, 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 I wish they had made better decisions with, I guess Mark had made better decisions with things like forward, to bring it back to politics for a second. I think there was a real opportunity that we missed um, because we just thought we could hack it. Uh, and and that, that has ultimately- Explain what he did and why you find it how, what do you find? I mean, be honest. Okay. What do, when, you, yeah. when I say for you, you say. I say for you, as you say. Um, debacle. Like, in a nutshell, I mean, and this is my biased opinion of it, but you, you take a lot of money, you take a lot of successful people, and then you approach a problem, Washington, and say, go solve it using your skills from technology land. And look, I'm a technologist first. But in my few interactions with trying to build a movement or be part of a movement, one of the most important things is actually having like a very clearly defined platform for what you stand for. And the core problem with Forward was that you, they couldn't go to people and say, here is what we stand for, other than by any means necessary. And so if we need to run ads supporting a candidate we need for an immigration bill, which I think we all support, we may have to run ads that are against a thing we all really care about, like the environment. How do you reconcile that? Uh, by any means necessary. And, and it is- Which is sort of Mark's MO, I mean. Oh yeah. I mean, with I a long know, list but... of lawsuits and screwing over his partners, et cetera. Yeah. I mean, any means necessary could be his credo. Yeah, yeah, you could imagine that on a hoodie, I guess. I mean, I, look, I, I don't know him. <laughs> well, well done. <laughs> I don't know him, but um, it's just, it, 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 it was, again, it made me sad because I feel, excuse me, we in tech right now are, and presumably this whole room is, so I'm just gonna generalize. We are right now sitting in one of the best industries in this country, right? We cannot hire enough people. We are doing amazing things. Things are going really well for us right now. The rest of the country, not so much. And I wish we had this as, a, as an example of like a leadership opportunity to really show like, look, we have a responsibility. Um, things are going really well over here, but like let's, let's, let's remember there's a whole other country that we need to also be doing well for us to do well. And we missed it. So hopefully the next one will learn from those missteps. I mean, Forward's obviously still around, but kind of kind of missed the boat. Yeah, they keep emailing me to get together and have lunch, and I'm just like, yeah. I, I don't care about politics. Leave me out of it. Yeah. Tell me about CISPA and PIPA and everything, and explain to everybody what all this is and why you went on such a jihad to try to stop it. That's a very loaded word. I, uh, is it? Is jihad a loaded word? I just uh, Really? The, um, well, SOPA PIPA was very, that was a very selfish thing because there's no way Steve and I could have started Reddit if either of those bills were law. I mean, they were so terribly written and such a blunderbuss. I'm paraphrasing a constitutional scholar here, but he called it a blunderbuss and it's such a great image. Um, the, 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 the intent was to curb piracy and what it would have done, the chilling effects, I guess, or whatever, the collateral damage, uh, would have been pretty much make it impossible for any one of us to create or manage any kind of open platform, anything that had even a, even a blog with a commenting system. Anyway, it was a really ham-fisted approach, and it was the result of 94, you can Google it, million dollars in lobbying from the entertainment industry. And, and it reminds me of a story, and, and that is, you know, this is the short version of it, and it's unfortunately something that's not gonna go away, even though we defeated those bills. Um, when my dad was, when I was in high school, my father, opened a travel agency. He was really excited. He'd been a travel agent for the last 20 years and he was like, finally saved up enough, he was gonna open his own business. And then the internet showed up with these online travel agencies and over my entire high school career, I would come home and have dinner every night with the family and see him get more and more pissed off until one day they cut his, all the airlines cut his commissions to zero because they didn't need travel agents anymore. And he sent a fax to, I think it was Continental, that just said, fuck you. And I like to think he put a cover sheet on it or something, but I don't know. Just to give him a little surprise. And, and he, he kept telling me, he was like, this internet, is, it, it, was, it was disrupting his industry, his very livelihood, my own father's livelihood is putting food on the table. And I thought, you know, this internet seems really cool, like I've been using it to make websites for Quake 2, let me make sure I'm on the right side of it. But at no point did my dad ever say, I'm gonna go call up my lobbyist or my lawyer. I'm gonna go down to K Street and I'm gonna change the rules and make it illegal for online travel agencies because we need to preserve our livelihoods. And yeah, there were a lot of travel agents who went out of business. My dad, to his credit, did not. He's still around, rocking it in Western Maryland. Um, 
but he adapted his business. And I think what, what's, what frustrates so many of us is that just from a simple business standpoint, the entertainment industry has been so lazy. It's like the worst business school case study ever because it's like, oh, consumer preferences have changed. Go to K Street. Go lobby and change the laws. Like, Ignore user preference. Yes. At all costs, do not give them do what they want. Do not actually care what users want. And they've done this for decades. You can find all of this on the interwebs. I mean, at the, the worst of it was Jack Valenti comparing the VCR to the Boston Strangler. And I'm not making that up. This is just crazy talk. And it's just so frustrating because the CEOs who are going to win are going to win so well because they understand piracy is a service problem. They understand that if they deliver a better service, Reed Hastings just came out a couple weeks ago saying that Canadian piracy went down 50% once Netflix showed up. Now, like, they use, the, the only way they use the Pirate Bay uh, is actually to sort of source what kind of content they want to put on Netflix when they go into new countries. Like, there are CEOs who will continue to adapt, whether it's in video games, music, film, whatever it is, and they're going to do really well with their businesses. And the incumbents, well, Hopefully, hopefully we won't let them destroy the internet on their way down. And you took on this um, SOPA issue. Um, was that your first time to really sort of dig in, lean into a political sort of issue? Yes, aside from accidentally joining a Iraq war protest in London in 2003. I mean, I stuck around because I was like, yeah, this is kind of cool. There's a lot of weed here. But, um, so wait, how did that happen? You, you like went into Starbucks, was studying, there's a long line, you come out no, was, and, and, there's, a, and well, there's a protest? I was studying abroad in London, uh, I guess it was 2003, yeah, and this was, was the run up to the Iraq war. And um, anyway, so no, I had never actually done, I didn't even, I didn't even have a tie, I borrowed my dad's. Uh, and, uh, and it was actually a really encouraging trip to Washington, right? If you tell someone who's historically, yeah, I voted, but I wasn't that active um, politically, you're gonna go to Washington, you're gonna meet some senators, some reps and their staffs, and four months later, a bill that they told you, two bills that they told you were inevitable are gonna become unthinkable because a bunch of people with internet connections change that, like, that's amazing. That's so inspiring. But uh, then you see shit like what's happening on TV and you're just like, uh. Bit of a disaster. Hey, you talked about your dad a little bit, yeah. being an entrepreneur and yeah. watching him struggle during your formative years. Mm -hmm. How did your mom and dad influence your being an entrepreneur and how do they look at your massive success today? Oh man, all right, I'm not gonna, all right. Mm. Um, you know, it's funny, the first, literally the first thing I did after we sold Reddit uh, was I upgraded my dad's season tickets. Unfortunately, we're Skins fans, so it, it's not like the best gift. It's kind of hard to upgrade. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's not like we're Giants fans or anything. <laughs> oh, and five. Yeah. No, you guys have. No, you guys got the trophies. It's okay. I, I'm, I, I actually, if if this were Philly, it'd be a very different. Wait, wait. So you story. called your dad? Take, I the, called take my me dad. to that phone. No, home. I called. Well, I called the Skins ticket office, and I said I'd like to upgrade my dad's season tickets. He had two in the nosebleeds, and I was like, "Give me the best you have." And he was like, no, we can't do that. I was like, the best you have, my friend. Mm -hmm. And he was like, all right, all right. And I upgraded to four, because I got my two best childhood friends. And, uh, and then I was like, I don't want to call my dad and tell him, can you please call him? And, uh, and he was like, yeah, sure, whatever, weirdo. I'm like, all right, just, yeah, as long as you give me your credit card info, I'll do whatever the hell you want, it, man. It is a little weird, but keep going. Yeah, no, I, well, I didn't want to be that, well. Why didn't you want to tell him? Well, because I wanted, I, I just wanted him, I wanted my dad to get a call from an unknown number and be like, what the hell is this? And oh, like, the Hello, surprise. It's the Redskins okay. ticket yeah. office. And then my dad be like, ah, oh, motherfuckers, you just want more money, Dan Snyder. And they're like, we're just here to call you. And, uh, and unfortunately, I gave him my dad's cell phone, and so he was driving at the time, which was really unsafe. But after he corrected his car without hurting anyone, yeah. uh, he called me back and he was pretty happy. Um, and, and you know, the, 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 oh man. The, the tough part though is the next thing I wanted to do is get something for my mom, uh, but there, is, there was nothing, nothing in the world that I could get her um, because she literally never wanted for anything. So I had to, I made a donation to one of her favorite charities. But um, that phone call, given everything else that was going on, um, was it meant the world to me um, because I could let my parents know that all of the all of the support they had given me for all those years, uh, and then more, more specifically in the year and a half after my mom had been diagnosed with um, the terminal brain cancer, that it was not it was not in vain, and and that that is a feeling that I will never ever 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 top, but. I'm, I'm working towards it. I am trying to live up to what my mom did for me, what my dad continues to do for me. 
And um, yeah, now I just hope the Skins can make the playoffs this year. <laughs> Well, thanks for sharing those. Let's take a couple of questions from the audience. If I have a microphone, I know everybody's got a lot of questions for you. While we're getting a question set up, um, tell me about um, what you think of Google and this incredible run they're having and Larry Page's, you know, moonshot approach. I, uh, I'm still a little skeptical about Google Glass, but uh, it's... It's wild. You've tried them on. What do you think of them? I tried them out for a minute, and I gave myself whiplash trying to <laughs> flick out. And, Google, yeah. now. I, 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 you know what? The, the self-driving cars are amazeballs. Quote me on that. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's great. I cannot wait. I think of all of the wasted man and woman hours behind a car driving or in traffic. Oh, just, it's, it's gonna be, that's going to be world-changing. Um, but anyway, Google, you know, uh, I guess the biggest... One of the interesting discussions I had randomly on the internet was about Google, whether Google will ever be too big to fail, whether it will ever be a company that is, and it was a while because I'd never thought about that. I only think of like, you know, companies that don't actually create value as being considered too big to fail. And I, it, I really, I don't know. I, I, they, they, they are, I think of how much, you know, when Gmail goes down, I feel like half the world just stops and says, all right, forget it. I'm going to play Candy Crush right now, right? <laughs> that is finally beat level 79, by the way. I am thrilled. There is, there is something a little scary about knowing even a company that has the motto of don't be evil has such a stranglehold on so much of our personal as well as business lives. So I, I don't know. It makes me a little uncomfortable and unsure about how to feel about Google. What do you think about privacy-wise with regard to storing stuff in the cloud, yeah. IP addresses. I don't know if you use VPNs or if you're anonymizing your search. I get the sense you're a kind of guy who does. Um, not for any nefarious reason, but because yeah. you understand exactly how easy it is to compromise yeah. your privacy. Yeah. What, what do you think the future is going to look like? And is there a business opportunity there? Yes. So I am, again, with the disclosure, I'm friends with, not an investor in DuckDuckGo. And love I DuckDuckGo. I love DuckDuckGo. And what's so cool is... It started out as something only among geeks and privacy wonks and like people who really cared about this stuff. And sure enough, after Snowden comes out, their traffic jumped. And you know, that's a search engine that is built around not storing anything you search for. And that's, again, if you ever hear anyone say, I have nothing to hide, they are lying or living the most boring lives imaginable. Because look, we all, I have business deals I am trying to hide. They don't have to be nefarious things. And so DuckDuckGo's original premise was we're not storing any of this. We're going to get you the search results and carry on. And I think, I think their success is an example of the business model. I also think for Europeans in particular who have much stronger privacy laws in a lot of countries, as well as the rest of the world, they're going to think twice about what services they're using depending on what servers that cloud happens to be in. And I, you know, perhaps there will be countries that find ways to step up as being hopefully totally sovereign states that are willing to hopefully stand up for the rights of the people whose data is on their servers. I mean, you know, you can talk to Kim.com about how that goes in New Zealand, but um, I don't know. It's, it's, I think it is a huge business opportunity, and that's exciting, too, because right, that's the source of a ton of innovation. Yeah. Okay. So question from our audience, and you can state your name, your company, and then a nice, clear, concise question. Hi. I'm Jack. Um, I wanted to know what your favorite subreddit or aspect of Reddit is. Right now, I am absolutely loving Hip Hop Heads. That's hiphopheads.reddit.com. And because it's football season, nfl.reddit.com are two amazing subreddits. Awesome. Good question. Yeah. Another question from the audience. Got one back here. We always have great questions from this audience. Who has the worst questions? Me. <laughs> no. No. Hi. Uh, my name is Justin. Uh, Sortbox is my company. Uh, the question I have is when you, at that point when you were trying to figure out the next thing when Paul said to you, you have to bury your baby. Um, what other ideas did you guys have? What came in second and third? Wow. Great question. That's good. I, I told gotta, you, these guys always have damn, great questions. All right, I got to think this one through. Um, man, I had, oh, 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 okay. Excuse me. Um, so this is good, and it's a plug for one of my favorite nonprofits. So I really, uh, the, one of the things that floated in my head was donorschoose.org has been around since like 2001. And it's funny, Vanity Fair, or I think 
uh, uh, I think it was Vanity Fair, wrote this article calling it the Kickstarter for public classrooms, which is particularly ironic because it is actually Kickstarter that is the donors choose for creative projects because it was around so much earlier. Um, I really wanted to do something around crowdfunding and, and I, at the time, was inspired by Donors Choose, and I thought, man, I wonder if there's a way for us to get people to pool a bunch of money together to just get stuff done. It wasn't as well-focused as Kickstarter. I mean, we all have a bunch of ideas, but I, I was really intrigued by the idea of people all over the internet putting money in together for something. Um, and it's probably why I've invested in some of the companies I've invested in. It's why I'm cautiously optimistic about Bitcoin and what that can do. But... One of the big takeaways that I hope every one of you remembers is that we all have amazing ideas and it doesn't really matter. Like no one ever says, hey, I've got this terrible idea I need to tell you, right? No one, has anyone ever come this up to you and said, this is a horrible idea. Horrible idea. Let Just me give waste me five 10 minutes. minutes. <laughs> yeah, no one says that. We all have great ideas. Execution, it's cliche, but it is everything. And, uh, and that's why developers have so much of the power in this economy because they can just do it. Hey, you know, you, we, you're an optimist. Yeah. Um, but you also talked about how America, you know, is different than the tech industry and something very different is happening out there. Yeah. Clearly jobs are changing. We don't have the factory jobs. We don't have the travel agent jobs like your dad. And um, now we see driverless cars coming. So another 10 years, yeah. it's pretty safe to say 10 years from now, there won't be cab drivers. Yeah. Um, maybe 15 years. I don't know. How many years do you think before the end of cab drivers? Let's make a long bet right here. I, you you want to pick the year and then I pick over under? Or how do you want to do it? I you're you're the I forgot you were a gambler. I love gambling. Yeah, I, let's make a long bet for something significant. Uh, okay, driverless cars. Are we let's talking make a like long bet. New York City? Let's make a long bet that we whoever loses takes all these people out to dinner. <laughs> that would be a great long bet. Wait, but a ten year bet? You like a ten year bet, and then remember? we all go get like dim sum and all right. That sounds, we'll go to get Golden Palace will still be there. Sounds, we're going to get dim sum. That sounds amazing. All right, let's do it. Long bet. So are all we right. going to both write it on a piece of paper? We or? have. We can record it using this video. No, no. no I'm just saying. Like, how, is what's the mechanic of the bet? Oh, is the mechanic of the bet? You pick a number, then I say oh, over I see, under, I or is the mechanic of the bet? Gambler. I. You tell me. I don't. Hmm. I'm a total hmm. rube. I'm the guy you invite to play poker with you. Yes. You know you're going to fleece me. Absolutely. Um, all right, here. This is an easy way to do it. Yeah. You pick how many years you think it will be, and then okay. I'll take the over or the under. That's okay. easy. So, and, and, and it is every, every cab is replaced by a, or Okay. Uh, we, we have City to define cabs. it. Majority of cabs in New York. 51%. 51% okay. will be the majority of cabs yeah. in New York. Majority of cab rides in New York. Because okay. we want to go by volume of rides, not... This is... I hope you guys are all... Not cabs, right? Because there could be more cabs, but the more rides would be done. Majority of cab rides are done without a cab driver. How many years before the majority of Texas cab is rides... Texas legalized... Uh, I think Texas And we could do San Francisco already. instead of New York if you want. No, no, no. Like, New York's the, good. Only city, New York. the only city that matters. It's true. It is the best city in the world. Right? Okay. How we, where, where do you call home now, by the way? I'm in L.A. right now. What's yeah. it going to take to get you to come back here? I... If I get one more win, this is what I tell my wife, I got this yeah. one more win brewing with Inside.com, yeah. and then I'm buying the Knicks nice. from James Dolan. Dude, I'm going to try to get the Nets from Jay-Z. This is going to be amazing. <laughs> this is going to be a good so, rivalry to go with this bet. I, I know Jason Kidd kind of squashed that one, but we're still yeah. a work in progress. Okay. All right. So how many years before the majority of cab rides, not cab drivers, but cab rides, are done without a human driver? Seven. Seven years. Yeah. I'm taking the over. I won. This is great. I'm taking the over. I think it's like 12, but I'm taking no. the over. That's it. Easy. Dude, I, I, have you been in one of those driverless You're cars? You're buying a lot of have fucking dim sum, That's dude. great. I will. A lot Seven of dim sum. Now. But wait, really, though? Have you been in one of those driverless cars? I haven't been in a driver's car, They're no. amazing. I know, but they cost like 100000 to outfit that. It's going to take at least 10 years, I think. But seven. a seven's fine. Seven. Majority cab rides, we have it documented. Yeah. Let's take another. Yeah. Anyway, my question yeah. related to Sorry, this absolute right, gambling, degenerate shit that we're doing right now is um, jobs are going away. Mm. What do you think is going to happen in society? Are we going to be able to find jobs for people? Are we going to have to redistribute wealth? How do you think we're going to solve this, like people talk about a minimum salary for all, a minimum payment for all people on the planet. So even rich people would get this like $1,200 stipend a month. Didn't Switzerland just uh, Sweden has been talking about this. Yeah. They made okay. like a crazy bill about oh, it. Oh, okay. Of course the Swedes. 
Like, yeah, kind of crazy. I got that figured out, man. Yeah. I guess just life in Sweden is like floating awesome. around. Yeah. IKEA furniture and Volvos everywhere. Yeah. Oh, I think the Volvos. Everybody's are on like uh, maternity or paternity. No, leave. Sweden's amazing. Um, yeah, it's pretty. I awesome. got this shit figured out. Um, okay. So jobs. Um, a yeah, job no, this is a huge. It's a huge problem. Uh, the reason why. Oh, shameless plug. Can I talk about a fundraiser I'm doing with Donut Yes. Shoes? Oh, yeah. Yes, plugs so are good. So I have a, a Prizio campaign. If you go to prizio.com slash Alexis, I am fundraising for every single STEM classroom in Brooklyn. Every single one of them on Donut Shoes right now. Uh, and the grand prize, it's like a raffle system. Uh, the grand prize is a year of mentorship from me. There are a bunch of other fun prizes. That's pretty too. amazing, dude. Uh, well, I'm trying to find out. You know, I love Brooklyn. And, me too. And I wanted... I, this is a huge. This is a huge problem. Because, and this is, Donut Shoes is one small part of working towards it. Um, we are going, we are at the risk, right? Okay, like so. This technology, if you know how to use it, can change your life and create so much value and so much wealth and so much innovation in such a rapid period of time, right? The Drew Houston Dropbox story started in a bus station. I think five years later, it's a multi-billion dollar company, right? Only on the internet can that happen. The people who have that ability will continue to be awesome and do amazing things and continue to spread the gap, further the gap between those who can and those who can't. And the societal repercussions of that are vast because by its definition, right? Like a smart developer, when she's sitting there working on some code, she finds herself doing the same task multiple times, she's gonna write some code to do it instead of her. Great software actually reduces the need for human labor. And so at scale, you're talking about, like I said, a lot of jobs that aren't gonna be done by humans anymore. And as it, like, I mean, I worked in a parking booth for a year, I knew that job was gonna get placed by a robot, right? But this is, that was a part-time job in college. We're talking at a scale that we just, as an economy, I don't know if we can frankly handle. And so right now, the glimpse that I see is, you know, it's the world of the jobs that can't be done by robots unless, well, until they enslave us. Like, they're the jobs that robots won't be we able won't to do make a long until they're sentient. No, I'm not. Because we wouldn't be able to go to Dim Sum anyway, we'd I mean, be slaves. Very, Did I get there before? Very good point. We were both well, on the... Well played, sir. That, like, and that's terrifying to me. It really is, because now you're left to, and I'm not sliding task rabbit here, it's just an obvious one we all know. Now we're left to a, a world of people who are just doing putting together furniture or, or doing, doing the kinds of tasks that a robot can't do nearly as efficiently. The, the other hope that I have is in the more creative work, the stuff that, again, a sentient robot could do but then would kill us, um, like more creative work, more like, you know, Zappos has built an amazing company on customer service. I hope, you know, it, it employs a lot of people who really love their jobs and are basically, they're just on the phone doing customer service all day. I, I hope that's a model for new tech companies that can still employ lots of people. But look, at the end of the day, Writing code is going to be the thing that is going to make a world of difference in the lives of so many people, and we have uh, a generation coming up that is so ill-equipped. It's 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 terrifying. So tell, give us the URL one more time. Oh yeah, Prizio, P-R-I-Z-E-O dot com slash Alexis. And so this Prizio, what do I do? I put in ten bucks, and I'm yeah. You in put the, in a, it, I think it's I forget how many. It's like every raffle ticket costs a dollar or two, and that's entirely given to donors choose. And there are a bunch of different prizes. If you want to go to a Nets game with me, you can put down. We definitely we want to do some price discrimination mm -hmm. so that we can get the ballers to give a bunch of money to donors choose, and we can go get waffles. That's an mm -hmm. actual prize. Sweet uh, waffles so are sweet. A bunch of different stuff. They've it is funny too because Prizio's worked with like One Direction and uh, Avril Lavigne and like legit celebrity Kobe Bryant, and then it's like Alexis. Do do do. Not here, you're like a, you're, you're internet famous. Uh, you know what that's worth? It's Nothing. it's sort of between like like on a VH1 reality series. It's sort of in that zone, internet famous. So I, that's saying, what I've learned. So you're saying I can get a VH1 show? <laughs> yes. Yes. I, after Silicon. No, no, Bravo is much more after famous. After Silicon Valley. Oh my God! What a nope. disaster! Nope. Piece of shit! Wow. Nope. That's why you want to know. Fun fact: I hope you guys all watch Small Empires on the Verge. Uh, oh yeah. That what, was is, a, what is that? That's that was your a show? response. Yes, that was largely a response to Silicon Valley and uh, the show the and show. the place. You guys yeah. are better burritos over there, but that's it. Yeah. And uh, and I wanted a, I wanted something that was like part inside the actor's studio, like this, but also showing the people who worked at startups and the people who use these platforms. So like being able to talk to, spoiler, a couple that fell in love in OkCupid, and then also seeing the story of the founders and seeing the stories of the employees in 22 minutes or so, I think gives a really, just 
fascinating and honest look into startup life, but also how these platforms are helping people help themselves and, uh, and also show off New York is the best place in the world to do a tech startup. True. Yeah. True that. Okay, one more question from the audience. Go. Hi, I'm Obed Eugene, uh, co-founder of Vouch. Um, YouTube recently announced uh, uh, changing their system of how comments are being done. Uh, they're looking to integrate Google Plus and also allowing users to vote up comments. And it sort of seems similar to the way comments are done on Reddit. Just wanted to know your thoughts and some of the pros and cons on how this system works. The, I think we can all agree any kind of upgrade to YouTube comments is a good thing. <laughs> Fun fact, before Yahoo, so in and I'm going to answer the question. In the fall of 05, like five months after we started Reddit, Google invited us to their offices, and me and Steve toured around the Googleplex all wide-eyed, and they basically made us an acquire offer. And one of the things they talked about was integrating... Who was it, Marissa or Larry or Sergey? Uh, Chris Who? Saka. Chris Saka? Chris Saka. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and, and they, they were talking about integrating into YouTube, so who knows? In another life, I mean, we are open source after all, people, but anyway, in another life, that could happen. Um, we then also went to Yahoo, and they made fun of us by calling us a rounding error compared to Yahoo's traffic, and the meeting went pretty poorly after that. I'm not gonna name, I'm not gonna name that executive, but it was, it was very... Really? No, I, did, I, don't, I don't name him, no. Oh. Because here's the thing, I, I'm sure oh, he doesn't fine. remember the meeting. I hope he still works in the Valley, and I hope to meet him one day and thank him because it was such good motivation. I went home and put it on my wall and said, it said, you are a rounding error. Put that up there, looked at it every day. Uh, the point is, I think it'll help. Uh, ultimately, you know, we, again, we see people acting awfully with their real name, with their photo, um, and so I think there's still gonna be those awful YouTube comments, but having a nested Vote, having a nested system with voting, so whether it's like Reddit or Discuss or those other platforms, I think will be an improvement. Um, but I don't know. I mean, YouTube is such a massive platform at scale. I don't know. How many users do they have a month? A billion. Really? No, you're just making that up. No, it's literally really? a billion. It's a billion? Well, which would you, I mean, what do you think is a more important fa platform, Facebook or YouTube? Wow. I, everyone sleeps it on YouTube. Everyone sleeps, sleeps on YouTube. The great, if that was an independent company, it would be worth 50 billion. Wow. Wow, well played. Well played, Google. That was a good acquisition. 1.7, um, right? 1.6, 1.7 billion, and damn. it's worth 50 today. Okay. 10% um, of Google's revenue. Wow. According That's, to the whisper number. Damn, all right. Well, so I, so I don't know. I, I can say it's going to be an improvement. I don't think it'll be a huge one. Uh, and until we get to the technology, and look, if any of you are working on this, it's going to be amazing. That will electrify, not, not severely hurt, but like just zap people who are being jerks on the internet. Via their keyboards. Yeah, right? Or glass, yeah. We could, oh, glass, yeah, right? Right there in the room. That would be amazing. You could, Douche. Ugh. Yeah, but it would probably. First, oh. The, <laughs> the problem is though, ultimately, see some of y'all are gonna work on this. The problem is you always have to know, you always have to account for the 1% of users who are just gonna find ways to exploit it, and so you'll spend most of your time dealing with the people who just want to electrocute people. F the number one. They always just, yeah. <laughs> Uh, RST. That's why we can't have nice things. All right, last question, last question. We do one more question, maybe? I see one more hand up there. I don't want to have that poor guy not have his question answered, and then we'll get the hell out of here. All right. And people can get this book right now, right? Yes. Without their permission, everybody go buy this book right now Please on do. Amazon on your mobile phone. It's we have the book there. here? Will, you, will he sign them? I have Sharpies. Awesome. Everybody buy a book? That's it. So Good. hi, uh, thank you for taking my question. My name is Mike Battaglia. I'm the co-founder of Triomi Medical Innovations. And the question I have is, uh, Reddit is so fascinating to me because it provides a service that's free and the code is open source. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of older you know, entrepreneurs, I think that idea is very foreign to them because we're coming from a world that focused on patents and focused on you know, proprietary information. And you guys have made a very extremely successful platform that is open source and free. And uh, I wonder if you have any insights in how you know you think the century will be uh, transformed by such business models and uh, future services like that. Thank you. Oh, Good all questions. Right. All right. I, I always tell people, and I really need to remember who said this quote, uh, that we all stand on the shoulders of giants and open source is the perfect, I mean, everything we are doing right now, everything you all are working on, you all know, would not have happened if it weren't for open source. So our decision to open source Reddit was because Steve and I felt like it was the least we could do because of our story not, not, could not have happened if it weren't for it. I think, what, and again, Mr. Optimism here, I think that we have a, a generation coming up of entrepreneurs 
who, whether it's because of social media, because for the first time now they can put something out there, their first Kickstarter campaign, and get feedback from a stranger in Tokyo saying, hey, this is cool. Um, or whether it's someone starting a startup now for you know, $10, um, has a different perspective on success because she knows firsthand what it was like and how they were able to really come up thanks to a lot of other people's work. And historically, it's been a lot easier to look yourself in the mirror as some tycoon and be like, me, that was me. Fuck the people in the factory, fuck the people in the fields, fuck the, like, and, and I hope, again, very optimistic, but um, I really hope it doesn't just mean more people like making open source contributions. Uh, I just hope it means a different type of business leader that doesn't see everything as a zero sum game. And that also realizes like, look, at the end of the day, I don't succeed unless my customers are happy, unless my employees are happy. I, I, it is it is shocking to me that Zappos is as successful as it is. Actually, it's shocking to me that Tony Shea's book, Delivering Happiness, was as successful as it was because the thesis was customer service is important, and a bunch of executives all over the world were like, "This is brilliant. We could have been treating customers well this whole time." Like, right? This is after they offshored it, yeah, and we're like, "This is not important. Let's yeah. just get the lowest price possible for customer right. service." And it's like they're talking to our customers. Why would we want to do why that? Why would we do that? Why would we actually make stuff people want and treat them Let's well? Let's pay like, somebody else to talk to them. Yeah, it, and so I think. That's a sign that the bar is set really, really low in so many industries. Uh, and I, I hope, I know this is, this is going to be the test of the millennials. No pressure, you guys. Um, but I think we can do it because, I mean, previous generation didn't give us many other options. Am I right? Sorry, guys. It's kind of fucked. It's true. I mean, it's true, right? Oh, yeah. I don't look at me. I'm Gen X. That was baby boomers who no, fucked everything <laughs> up. No, Gen X and millennials you know, are right there actually, with each other. You know what's fun, though? You know what's really fun? I found an article. I'm gonna, I should just post this up. Spoiler. I was gonna, I found this old article from the Times of the Post, some opinion piece, about 15 years ago. Um, and if you replace the word, if you replace the phrase Generation X with millennial, it's the exact same oh, criticism. Oh, absolutely. The they're exact lazy, same they're criticism. self-indulgent. Yeah, same thing. Yeah. But Sorry. the millennials are a little bit self-indulgent. Uh, well, let me take this. Let me take this selfie real quick. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> take a take selfie. That, 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 that. All right. On that note, uh, listen. Thanks, TechServe, Dash Lane, Trinet, Squarespace, WeWork, and of course, most of all, our guest Alexis. Big round of applause. <laughs> and we'll see you all next time on this week in startups.